Hi, I'm Travis B. Hill. Uh, I'm the creator and writer of Thorn, uh, as well as some other comics, which we'll be talking about today. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Travis B. Hill 5. And you can also find me on the internet. You can see my portfolio at TravisBHillComics.com. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented writer. He is a comic writer, but he is also a PhD student, uh, probably has his PhD by now, so I have to call him Dr. Travis B. Hill. But we are joined by the ever-talented Travis B. Hill, creator of Thorn and a bunch of other comics that I'll let him talk about during the interview. How are you doing today? I am well, Kurt. Thank you for having me on. Blast to be here. Not a PhD yet, so not doctor. I finished my exams this fall, and then I'll write my dissertation. But close, close. <laughs> but the, I always, I always joke and say the only people I'm going to make call me doctor or my two brothers everyone else can keep calling me travis so that's it once you become a, a doc in your respective major there and we'll talk about that as well too you know you'll be probably my third or fourth doctor i've had on the show so that works out there we go i'll come back at that time we'll yeah. talk more which means i'll have to have a, a doctor panel on comics and uh, their creations as well too so danny gorney yourself and doc uh Carlo S. San Juan from the Philippines will have to come on and do a roundtable session. That'd be good. No, that'd be great. I mean, you know, there's, you know, comic studies conferences, comic and pop culture conferences. Those are big. I'm going on a panel for the Spider-Man and pop culture conference at Bowling Green uh, State University in September. Our panel is, I have a theology degree from Dallas Seminary, master's in theology, so our panel is religion and Spider-Man. And so there are four of us will be presenting short papers and then we'll have like a kind of Q&A. So, yeah, I mean, come on, let's do it. Let's, let's have a round table. For those, and I always jump ahead because, you know, you're just such an interesting person. So, but for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talk. My name is Travis B. Hill, and uh, I know that we're going to be talking about Thorn. Uh, today a little bit. That is um, a new comic that I have with Advent Comics. It's coming out. Issue one's coming out July 11th or July 5th. Sorry. Uh, issue one's coming out in shops July 5th. Uh, Pre-orders are, are closed now. So you might want to just check with your local shops to see if you can get it. Uh, it's the first of a 12 issue series from Advent. <clears throat> it's uh, I know we'll talk more about it, so I won't give away too many details. Other than that, um, as far as comics goes, I am the lead script writer and uh, associate project manager with Sequential Potential Comics, or SP Comics, uh, where we collaborate with academics, nonprofits, scholars, researchers uh, to turn their uh, scholarship into comics. And so we sometimes create uh, like a one shot, like a 20 page issue. Uh, we're working on a couple of graphic novels. Um, we make one page abstracts. We create these comic abstracts for uh, professors articles when they want to try to get more people to read it and, and they can put the abstract out on social media. And a comic is really inviting as opposed to maybe a normal, you know, two paragraph abstract, something like that. Um, and then, you know, something I just finished up a script yesterday. Uh, we've done a couple of these uh, like, short four to eight page comic prologues that introduce uh, the research ideas in the book. And so those will have been at the front of research books, you know, the first four to eight pages, somebody can pick it up off the shelves at Barnes and Noble, open it up and say, Oh, here's a comic, read it and be like, Oh, is this what this book is about? And, and kind of get introduced to all the ideas and themes that they're about that they, you know, they could read if they, pick up that book so uh very interesting work a lot of fun that's what i do all day so um these kind of academic comics merging my uh studies with with my love of of comic writing and scripting and so and then i've got a couple of other anthology projects and and um other series in the works so some people know me from techno nights with dauntless stories uh you know with marcus Jimenez on the art over there um 
we book one uh, came out a couple months ago and and you know has received a lot of solid reception i'm enjoying the feedback and we i'm editing book two right now and book goes into art production uh in the fall so you know there we go so a little bit on your plate a little bit yeah i um at the end of every week i take inventory on like what's what i've worked on because as the project manager i'm like juggling a lot of like right now we have nine or ten projects going over at sequential potential and so i'm the back and forth between our clients the researchers and and the artists or creators and sometimes i'm writing the script but sometimes not and so this week we tried to close three projects so i'm talking with three different artists and our creative director and be like hey we got to get these files packaged so all that kind of stuff so i was working on you know about seven or eight projects over there and then i had my own uh four or five like i had to send off an anthology pitch this week and and in the midst of all of that and so um, but I love it. I, I, I keep, you know, feeling how blessed I am to just get to do this, wake up and write comics and talk to artists. That's what I do all day. And so, um, it used to be a hobby where, you know, I was kind of working in the nonprofit sector up until this past January. And, um, you know, it was a hobby for six years and it was great. And I got some stories picked up and, stories like Thorn got under contract and now I just get to kind of spend my time focusing on comics in a way that you know it's it's hard I was talking to my creative director yesterday it's, it's hard to draw the line because I used to go to work and come home and work on comics or spend my weekend working on comics but now it's like my job so you got to get up and so when do you kind of draw the line yeah. instead of saying like oh I'm going to work from 8 a.m to 11 p.m I'm trying to find a good like work life balance where I'm not spending, you know, 14 hours a day, six days a week writing these stories, even though it's fun, you know, I got to do some other things sometimes, but you know, and they give me some space to work on my papers for school and stuff. It's good that you've turned a hobby into a career and it's great to see that you're doing very well with it as well too. And you're helping others realize their dreams too. We have to talk about Thorne. Give us the elevator pitch of Thorn. Sure. The, the log line is the way I've been describing it to people is it's Batman, but Commissioner Gordon is this main villain, right? So it's been interesting to talk about that because some people are like, oh, so it's like a crooked detective. I'm like, no, it's like a crooked entire justice system, but it's pulled from very real scenarios that we see all the time with just the way police kind of interact in an unjust way, criminal justice system interacts in an unjust way, but even down to the city planning and how that can act unjustly to people who live in a city, you know? So it's looking at all of that. It's taking those themes and trying to explore what type of hero arises when that person, Thorne in this case, the vigilante, looks at all of that system and realizes across the board how crooked it is and he's trying to just protect his neighborhood from that crookedness. That's that's kind of what it is. What is the most misunderstood aspect about this genre that people who don't follow it misunderstand? The vigilante genre is about justice in particular ways, but it's with a kind of a main character who has an obsession and feels like at some point they were denied justice or protection from something right and so they have to provide that type of protection that's what i think is kind of so from there you can explore a lot of different themes about justice and and oppression and liberation and those types of things from the genre depending on the vantage point of of the vigilante character right so we see you know, we see batman he thinks he's been slighted in life because his parents were murdered. And so now he's got to, Hey, I've got to clean this up from Gotham. I mean, you know, we got crazy stories now it's kind of gone away from that, but like, that's what Batman's mission is, right? Like I have to protect people in Gotham so that they don't have to go through what I went through because the justice system wasn't enough to protect me from whatever this harm is. Right. Spider-Man, it's his guilt, like his guilt over, not doing enough early on to preserve justice from a criminal. And so now he has to do everything he can to kind of absolve this guilt 
but also not let other people die like his uncle Ben died, that kind of thing. So that's that's what I think the genre is. But there's kind of like an obsession. Even Rorschach in, in Watchmen has this obsession to the truth, right? And he has this kind of twisted upbringing, right? Where he was kind of abused. And, and so now he is kind of a, a, you know, violent abuser a little bit, but he's got this bent towards the truth um, that he feels like he was denied. You know, how has your degree informed yourself as a comic writer? I, people, people are going to watch this and be like, I'm tired of hearing this guy tell this story, but I have developed my comic writing in step with my uh, academic scholarship. So when I was at, Sem- at Dallas Seminary, if you go to my website, you can see uh, the first chapter of a graphic novel that I'm working on called Mustard Seed. It's completely done. The first chapter is completely done. You can read it. And so I, that is based on uh, the, the graphic novel itself, Mustard Seed, is based on my last two years living in Shreveport. My, my roommate and I, my best friend, we had a, we were working with a bunch of teenagers in the, in the neighborhood that we lived in, Sunset Acres. Um, and and one of the guys got kicked out uh, by his dad and said he can't come back. And so he came to live with us. And so it's about kind of that experience of, you know, learning to do life together in this very kind of found family type way and and learning from each other and, and, and kind of realize starting to realize things for the first time and just being introduced to different types of struggles in the world. And so that's what it's about. That was I left Shreveport to come to Dallas to start working in nonprofit and to go to Dallas Seminary. And so at that time, I was I was far enough removed from from Shreveport in that time in my life. I started to kind of reflect, you know, like, OK, thinking about themes and the way I think about that theologically and philosophically and just um, like the experience we had and what it meant. And so I thought and of course, I was I'm a huge comic reader from like age five, you know, three. I don't know. Um and so I was about 30 years old at the time. And I said, man, this might be a comic book. Like I could write this as a comic. Like I could envision retelling this narrative, like kind of this time in my life as a comic. I might have an idea here. And so I went to, I had um, taken a couple of classes in the arts department. I went to the head of the arts department at the seminary and said, I signed up for a like little weekend comic book writing class in New York with a uh with the associate editor of spider-man at the time tom brennan and so i was like hey i'm just gonna take this comic writing class so i can kind of learn the form and kind of just just get the basics i just need the basics because i know how to write i just need to know how to write in this style just give me the basics which was great i went up there but i told my professor at seminary um i said hey i'm i'm going to go take this writing class and I think I have a comic idea and I've signed up for your collaborative art and theology class where the course was about creating art with the, with the, with, you know, kind of taking the theological themes that you're thinking in your, in your head and kind of how does that communicate through your art? So I was like, Hey, I'm going to take that class and kind of flesh out some of these ideas. And he was like, Oh, well, you need to get with Mark Pate. This guy, Mark Pate, he's a comic book artist on campus. And, and so um, doing the same kind of degree, we were both doing master of theology or whatever. And so I met with Mark, um, who is the artist of Thorn and Mustard Seed. <laughs> so here we are, you know, seven years later on this journey. Um, and we found out we lived in apartments across the street from each other, like literally like his front door is across the street from my front door. So we started hanging out uh, once a week on Mondays, all Monday afternoon. He was working on his own project. I was working on mine. And he kind of just helped me sign up for some other classes like character development, plot development. So I was taking all these classes in the art department while I was really I was focused on systematic theology. Like that's uh, what I was <laughs> writing my uh, thesis in uh, over there. But at the same time, I was developing mustard seed. And so um, that's kind of how my learning has informed this. Right. And then um, I get to my. PhD program in 2019. This is when I started in the fall and um, started my PhDs are in, I have three fields, comic book studies, 
American religious history and the long civil rights movement or U.S. civil rights history, if you will. And so I started thinking on those things um, and I wrote a paper. There was a conference that I went to um, and it was called Origins. And it was like it was about origin stories. So papers thinking through origin stories and the origins of things. And I was thinking about the origin of Batman, Superman. Well, mainly Batman and Spider-Man, right? And I wrote a paper called um, Black Vigilantism in an Anti-Black World. And what would that look like? Like what, you know, Batman, okay, but Bruce Wayne, you're rich and white. So the system is going to work out for you. Like you are on this mission, but the system is not, is not, is built to help you. That's what it is. But what happens when you have a system that, like in America and, and, in, and in most of the world, but obviously this is my cultural context I've grown up in, that is an anti-Black culture. I mean, in terms of the legal system, and it has been, you know, because I'm studying this history and all that. Yeah. And so I present this idea, um, thinking about Thorne and, and, and then wrote a short story about it. And then I was in, uh, I went ahead and took two script writing classes um, and developed the first four scripts of thorn thorn one two three and four in that time and so that's how like all of these themes that i'm thinking about my my way to instead of always i mean i'm writing you know papers i'm this conference um at bowling green in september like i've written that that's a that's a chapter that I've written for a book called religion and Spider-Man that I'm presenting. I, I have a chapter in a book called uh, Spider-Man and theology that came out in 2021. So I'm writing these papers that I think, you know, my, my learning kind of in, where it kind of crosses with comics and, and I have other books I've written, but one way to explore what I'm learning has become like, how do we, how can, what, what would it look like in a comic narrative, you know? Yeah. Because you can you can write papers all day, but sometimes ain't nobody reading those. <laughs> Nobody's reading those, but somebody will read a story, you know. So that's just like you know, if you post a, a video on YouTube, you know, either you're going to get a thousand views or you're going to get one person that's yourself. So you know, <laughs> yeah, sure, that's it. But also, me telling you what you know, Spider Verse is about, right? I just because that's the most recent movie I've seen. Versus you going to watch across the Spider Verse, mm. me telling you what the themes and the meaning of Spider Verse is about, versus you going to watch it. More people are going to go watch it than hear me talk about what I think the philosophy is about. Was, was it a good film? Because I haven't seen it yet. So <laughs> it's it's very good. It's it's high packed. Here's what I have been saying. No spoilers because they've already said it's part one of a two part thing but more so than almost any movie i've ever watched it just doesn't end like it it stops in the middle of a story is basically what happens and so for me people are like oh it's an incredible film and i'm like well it's an episode of a of a of a two-part series but it's not really a film and it's excellent i mean from musical score to the animation, everything about it is excellent. The story so far is excellent. Like it's excellent. So, um, but then, but then uh, just this morning, someone pointed out, well, one character from start to finish has a narrative arc that resolves. And, and I mean, they told me I'm not going to give that character away. And I said, Oh, you're right. You're right. So much is going on that. I forgot that that happened. So, if that's the case, like if we're just looking at it through that character's lens, then it's a very good film for that character. It is so, but definitely worth the watch. I'm going to go see it again next week with my wife. But after that, I probably won't watch it again until next March, mm -hmm. right before the next movie comes out, like the day of like whatever that Thursday is, I'll take an afternoon, watch the first one and then go watch the second one. Nice. Um, just because the the cliffhanger is so frustrating it's like why do i want to watch this if i don't know what's going like it, you know i, I want to see the thing get to an ending but uh but it's good it's very good uh, a lot of fun to watch but you know um i think into the spider-verse was 
is one of the best comic book films ever top two in in my opinion and um and i could rewatch that all day it's so good what was an early experience where you learned that language had power and i'm gonna add a secondary question to it and how has that helped you as a comic writer gosh I don't, I don't know. That's a, that's a powerful question. That's deeper. Um, I don't know of a first experience. I just think of my time as a, mainly when I think of language being a powerful tool, um, I think of great orators, right? People who can really speak and, and give these inspiring speeches, um, which I am not. And, and but also, I've always been impressed with the power of people who can be soft spoken when making a presentation, giving a sermon, giving a, a speech where they're really soft spoken, but they have everybody hanging on every word because they can just just communicate in a in a in a great way. And so I think about language as as what it's meant to be, right? A mode of communication. Um what I think is best about the power of language is people who know how to, I'm just not one for a bunch of big fancy words. And, and if you can communicate to a wider audience who, if you're not trying to make your language super selective and kind of high academic, which will exclude people. But if you're trying to communicate in, in ways and I think that's kind of what makes sequential potential fun is because we are taking this very dense academic research and, and people in the academic field don't use language to exclude people. I don't think, I think they use it to get very kind of intricate points across. And so they have to use very specific language, which is great, but then they have this, they're making this effort by using comics to invite different types of readers and different types of people into it. So I think the power of language is your ability to invite people into the way you think about the world um, and, and, and just to communicate with people about the you, way you understand things. And so I feel like my understanding of language has developed and the power of it has developed over time. I can't point to an exact point. <laughs> when you think of, when you, when you ask me that, I start thinking about, the first time I had to give a five minute speech in my intro to communication course in college, my freshman year. And I was like, and it could be on anything. And I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to talk in front of anyone ever. And then, you know, I taught high school math for four years and, and then I was a basketball coach. And so it's like, I talk in front of people all the time now. Like I make presentations at conferences. And so it's, you know, you make this journey, but it's, you make this journey with language and, and knowing what is meaningful to say and not, and sometimes getting it wrong. And um, yeah, my wife and I go to this comedy club on Thursday nights as often as we can. And we see, you know, local comics doing their thing, you know, cutting their teeth a little bit. It's the free show on Thursday because so we like that, yeah. um, but, but they're good. And sometimes they're really bad, but they're up there and they're, and they're getting better and and it's fun to watch people develop their confidence and that kind of thing with language and and with knowing what to say and learning what not to say and and so yeah i don't know that's a long answer and it probably has not a whole lot of bearing on what you asked but um and i think that that helps me with comics as well um you kind of think about you know how you can communicate to other people um in the dialogue uh, uh comics has this three tier in my opinion i don't know this isn't like in a book or anything but has this three tier uh method of of delivering information right captions through the narrator dialogue through the characters and then the visuals through the through the artist who's you know, providing. So you can, so you, so you're, you can layer a, a story three different ways. Um, and, and you can give meaning to it 
a lot, you know, visually, you can do visual kind of like straightforward or metaphor. You can, your narration can be about something completely different themes and ideas and philosophy, but your dialogue can be, you know, whatever. So um, I think the cool thing about comics is you don't have to use all the language that you think you have to use textually um, because you have these different modes of communication. So you can, <clears throat> you can trust your readers a lot more. Um, you have to, I mean, Scott McLeod talks about the gutters and, you know, having to, the reader has to participate, right? Um, same with, uh, Nick Susanus in Unflattening talks about the participation of the reader, um, and, and how that enhances the communication. So, you know, I think the language in comics has to be constructed in such a way that allows the reader to participate with not just what's being said but what's being shown and and what's not being shown and so yeah so a lot of i think um all of that to say that what's informed me is my selection of of language and and what to say and not say everyone usually asks on these types of interviews what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bs piece of advice you've ever received but what is the second wisest piece of advice that you received that has stuck with you in your career what the thing for me is write write it like the, the biggest uh, people get stuck and i got i've gotten stuck before like oh, i don't know what this is going to just write the thing write the thing get it out on paper and you and then and then figure out the rest so that's that's been a good piece of advice that I've carried with me. Um, you know, just whatever it is, get it out. Don't just sit here and be like, Oh, I've got this idea, but I can't figure out. And just write it out, get, get it out. And then you can start to develop and add and, and massage or whatever. But, and that's, that's me with the script stage. I'm like, golly, I don't know. And I'm always like super nervous when this is an experience, right. With that. I'm thankful for that kind of, tells me I'm doing okay for now. I don't know, you know, maybe down the road, I might be bad at this, but for now I'm doing okay. Um, I always get nervous because I send off my scripts to clients who have contracted us and are paying us out of their, you know, hard earned research money to make these comics. And we've gone through conversations. Uh, usually we have a couple of meetings and then I get their material and I read it and I'm like, okay, here's my idea. And they're like, all right, I like that idea. Let's see where it goes. And then I give them uh, the the script and I'm always like, you know, they just, you know, they're paying for this. This could be really bad. Like I could have written a really bad thing. And uh, I don't have much anxiety in life, but it's that like, while I'm writing a script for a client specifically like that, um, I just get like super like, you know, it takes me a lot longer, but then I have to remind myself, just write the thing, just write the thing. And then we can figure how to change it later. And so, uh, but this, this week I had a really good experience. I was a week behind on a deadline, which I hate being behind on deadlines at all. Like ever, like my big thing for a long time was I've never missed a deadline. I've missed a few now, but now, now that I have, you know, 15 deadlines a month, I miss a few and that's, a, it's not okay, but eh, you know, um, it happens. And so I was a week behind and I was like, just trying to get this thing written. Um, and I was doing damage control on some projects last week, just because, you know, we had some deadlines and I had to make sure the artists were meeting them and the art and the, and the files, not damage control, but just like, it was a, it was a, it was a high intensity week. Yeah. And so I didn't get the chance to spend as much time on the script as I wanted. And so I spent the holiday weekend kind of getting it all worked out. And I sent it off and I was like, man, I hope this isn't bad. Like it's just, I like it, but I hope it's not bad to them. Cause you never know. And then um, a couple hours later, I got an email back from the client and was like, Hey, this is great. Uh, love it. But I got a couple of edits. And so I was like, Oh yes. You know? So my thing is, but it always starts with that advice, like write the thing, just get it written and then figure everything out. And a lot of time, more often than not, like people will like it. And, and, and if it's bad, have this is my second thing. Um, have a good editor. Don't ever. I've heard people say, "I'm like, oh, who's the editor on your comic?" You know, people doing indie comics, and 
people doing indie comics uh, and Kickstarters, which I love. I love supporting Kickstarters, but I'm all, you know, sometimes I'll be like, Hey, okay, you've kickstarted like five issues of this thing. Like who's, who's the editor and the writer. <laughs> a lot of times the writer will be like, Oh, well, I'm, I'm an editor. So I just, I edit myself. And I'm like, no, no way. I've never, I've, I've had an editor on almost every, you know, story I've done at some level. And, um, and they've always made the book, the comic better, whether it's a four, you know, there's, there, I've got this story coming out in limit break, uh, limit break. Uh, they've got their new anthology called fractured, fractured realms. And it's about like horror, like Norse mythology, but you take a, like you take an old Norse myth and you turn it into a horror story. Right. Yeah. And so, um, it's just a four page story and I sent it off and the, the editor, uh, Paul and Greg, Paul and Gary, Gary Mahoney, uh, Paul Carroll, Paul Carroll and Gary Mahoney were over there uh, at Limit Break and they sent me notes back. And I was like, oh, they're like, hey, like you're characterizing this character one way, but if, if you stick to this kind of characterization, it probably enhance the story and then you can do this. So think about that. And I was like, oh, that's way better. Like that's way better. And so I, I kind of, um, you know, a couple quick edits and and boom better story right so um same thing with techno nights right uh brent fisher they are fantastic yeah, yeah. just a fantastic uh, just at everything they're great at everything right uh, uh anthology curator i mean um and 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 storyteller and, and writer i mean just great and and great at editing so they um they made one suggestion um, they they had some small suggestions, but it was one big suggestion to Techno Knights to to hey you need again kind of like what's going on with my complaint about the across the Spider Verse right I had written a, a story that just kind of ends and it didn't have like a narrative arc no resolve and uh, and Brent was like you need to have something at the end that kind of you know this is a series but every single installment of this three book series needs to be its own story. Mm -hmm. And so think about doing something like this. And that's, um, it, you know, if, if you read techno nights, the big yeah. spaceship crashing to earth, space station crashing to earth scene, that wasn't even in, in the original draft. And then Brent was like, you should add something at the end. And, uh, and I was like, what about this? And they were like, yeah, <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. So that's my thing. Um, so, so write the thing get an editor to read the thing and help you out, whether it's just a friend um, that can, that can help you out um, that does stories as well. And then the last thing you asked for first and you asked for second, I gave you first, but third is a uh, cut dialogue. After you write it the first time, cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it while the art's being, cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it. Um, yeah. And then you'll have something. <laughs> so that thing that 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 one thing that you want that character to say where he he or she or they wax poetic across a page for 650 words cut that <laughs> get i've written it in every book and then it's like no cut that everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today who is that for you man um <clears throat> I think in terms of like comic book writing, uh, I think of two comics that, well, one that I really appreciated before I ever even thought to be a comic writer. And that was uh, Pride of Baghdad by Brian K. Vaughn and just the way it ends. And, and, you know, it's, it's kind of an animal farm situation where you've got these animals and uh, that, you know, kind of the Baghdad Zoo during the bombing um, of Iraq. And and so he's telling this kind of political conflict and, and kind of societal conflict through these through these animals, you know, again, kind of like animal farm. And, and so I thought that was very clever. Um, 
And I thought, man, you can tell a very good story in, in a sleight of hand way. And that's in comics, you know, that made me realize that. And, but you can also kind of make it emotional because at the end, um, you know, I'm, I'm t- now I'm losing my memory. I don't know. The lions die, right? Uh, if you haven't seen it, I'm sorry. Or if you haven't read it, I'm sorry. And, and so then, but it's be- those, those lions were shot and killed by U.S. soldiers uh, in real life. So Vaughn took this real life news story and infused it with this meaning um, of these anthropomorphic characters to, to, um, to kind of say what he wanted to say about the, the U.S.'s war uh, in Iraq, right? And so um, I just thought, Man, that would, and, and in the end, the end, he says, and a lot of other people died too. And just thought, dang, like that's pretty heavy. Just one line like that in a couple words. So I, I thought that was pretty inspiring and just like, oh, if I ever wrote a comic one day, maybe it could be this good. I don't know. That's kind of how you think when you do these things. But um, I think more personally, uh, for me, um, Robert Wilson. Uh, he's the artist on um, Heartthrob and and he did an issue of Barbaric. Fantastic artist. Um, he was willing to mentor me for a year. So to graduate from my um, theology program, I ended up needing to do an apprenticeship in the arts department because I couldn't um, qualify for a internship the way I needed to um, in time to start my PhD program. It was, it was kind of a mess. But because of that, I had to move over to the arts department and do an apprenticeship in an artistic uh, field of my choice. So comic book or like an art medium of my choice. So I was like, oh, comic books is going to be the art medium. And so um, part of that was you had to go find a mentor in that medium uh, to mentor you for a year, you know, school year. Um, So Robert was living in Dallas at the time. He lives in Oklahoma City now, and, and he had always been super helpful. Um, answering my questions. He had met up with me and Mark once to kind of give us some advice on on the pages of Mustard Seed and just talk about comics and the industry and all that kind of stuff. And so I reached out to him and he agreed to mentor me for a year and gave me just tons of advice and, and not just comic advice, but comic business advice. And he's just very heady about how to approach the industry. And I was just really inspired by that one, by his uh, kindness and generosity Um, him introducing to me, there was never a moment where he made me feel like an underling, uh, always made me feel like a friend. I mean, there were people that I kind of starstruck around, maybe starstruck is a bad word because I don't really get that way, but people who I was like, oh, this is the person that wrote this, right? And this is the person that wrote this. And and he was like, oh yeah, I know them. Like they're my friends. And so he would introduce me as like, oh, this is my friend Travis. Not not at once did he say, oh, this is a guy that's helping me out or a guy that I'm kind of showing or not. He's just always, this is my friend. So just the kindness he showed me um, and and just the way he navigates in the industry with with what I think is integrity and and and, and kindness um, that was real inspiring and so kind of showed me like hey approach comics in a particular way because we hear all these stories about these fucking assholes in comics and and, and abusive men and and just all of that and and I kind of hadn't really got into comics much at that point. But I, the stuff I knew was like, oh, there's a lot of, you know, cis head white male assholes in comics. Like, I would look like a normal comic piece of shit coming in, and and so I was just like, ah, oh, that's kind of a toxic environment. But Robert, in a in a different way, showed me like, eh, there are very the, like the community is very kind in this way. If you think about it in a particular way, now if you are, yeah, don't be one of those people and don't associate with one of those people. And you know, so anyways, that's getting off on a different point. But Robert has been very inspirational to me, and we're you know we're friends now, and and uh, we talk you know, semi regularly. And and um, but yeah, he was pretty inspirational for me as I was getting into to doing comics and and kind of just taught me about like I said the industry itself, getting my start the business of the industry and then just kind of how to navigate it uh, with humility and, and, and kind of friendship and those types of things. So it was good.
From a professional standpoint, you have a master's degree and soon to be a PhD in an amazing field. You've created comics as well, too. So you're successful in that regard on on many fronts. So professionally, you're successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Um, Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Professionally, yes. I'm successful in ways that uh, I've been published. I'm in shops, like that kind of thing. And that's great. But you know, it doesn't translate into some anybody in comics, whether it's Kickstarter or on the stands, knows that it's hard to translate it into uh, a big like monetary thing. Um, that's why I'm I'm thankful for my spot over at Sequential Potential. Um, you know, because I'm able to do this. But man, I but I tell everybody every day, like my wife's amazing. Um, and ever since I've been married to her, every day feels like a vacation. Like just, it's great. Like people, we, her and I talked about it one time cause she, um, it, you know, her and a couple of other, her friends, our friends, like kind of got married in the same time and they were having problems early on in their marriage that we kind of weren't having. And, and she was like real worried about it. And and she was like, should we be having these types of problems? And I was like, I hope not. Like, I'm not trying to have those problems. Um, and, and I just, uh, and I said, look, I don't, every day, us being married, this is, this, I, I say it all the time. Like, this feels like a vacation. We're almost at six years, six year vacation. That's what it is. This guy's ups and downs, but, and so that, you know, I've got good friends um, that, that, good community, good life. Um, I'm probably declining in health now that I'm not out of my athlete phase, though maybe not that. But, um, you know, we can, I feel like I'm successful in that, like personally, just within my relationships and in my friendships. And so that, yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. But yeah, I think so. Like, I don't, I think my personal success very much outweighs and outlasts and overextends beyond any of my professional success in 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 comics or academics for sure so um yeah that's again you're asking these questions <laughs> so i'm sure i have more answers and about the you know the ways i think i'm gonna i'm impacting the world beyond what i'm creating but i don't know i just think like i think i'm personally successful yeah i like where i'm at the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? <laughs> um, I'm going to give you the Giannis Antetokounmpo answer. Um, there is no failure. It's all steps to success. Um, earlier this year when the Bucks lost in the playoffs, or like right after they lost in the postgame presser, one of the Bucks media beat writers. I mean, the Bucks ended up number one in the East. They were, you know, kind of favorites to go to the finals. Um, and they lost to the eight seat in the first round. And so the beat writer asked them, um, do you, you know, with all these expectations and finishing the first seed and you've lost the eight seed when you had like finals aspirations, do you consider this season a failure? And you know, Giannis is super emotional, right? He's he's kind of he's just lost after this kind of grueling NBA season, and and with these expectations on his shoulders, and he was perturbed. It was like, why would you ask me that? And then he said, um, "There is no failure in sports. There's only steps to success." So, I guess that's it. That's my answer. There is no failure uh, in what I do. It's only steps to success, and so. There you go. I like it. Yeah, that was that was a great response to it. I mean, he could have told the guy to fuck off and just walk. He could have. Yeah, very much. <laughs> but he gave, he gave probably the the best response to that type of question, and I've yeah. watched that a few times. It's like, yeah, it's it's. Yeah. We also and and just to kind of segue off of that real quick is, we don't look back on what we do and look at the victories we've had. We only see a, a project complete, but we don't understand or, or recognize our path to the successes that we've accomplished and my thing is like i mean setting aside the the humor and using Giannis's answer but i i mean 
in the end, we can say, like, if you didn't achieve a certain goal, then the way to handle that, and we call that failure. Because honestly, like, yeah, Giannis, you failed. You wanted to win a title and you failed at it. Like, you did not succeed. Now, if you go get one next year and you say, oh, well, then I, what, if you point back to this moment and say, this is what helped me get there, then you learned from it and you figured out how to be better the next time. And I think that's what it is. Like, if you want to say, oh, I didn't achieve my goal, so I failed. The way you handle that, if you want to continue to achieve that goal, if you then you then you have to learn from it and figure out how to be better next time. I mean, um, I was just reading the I think it's Detective Comics. One thousand seventy two, the the one Rom V is writing the most recent one that came out this week. I was reading it last night and they were you know talking about something that makes Batman great. Uh, I think it was the villain who was beating him. <laughs> I'm so, I don't know if that matters. It was like the, it was the narration. Yeah. But um, the thing about Batman is not that he wins right away every time. It's that he knows how to learn from defeat and, and, and then he's able to beat the enemy. That's what he's able to do. Like his, the way he can strategize is he, he's got to take a couple lumps and then figure out, okay, this is how I, beat you this is how i strategize against you and so they showed like he was fighting these two characters that had kind of you know worked him over a couple of a uh, couple of issues earlier but now he learned their weaknesses after the first fight and and so he took them out with ease so that's kind of the thing you know so there you go that's that's what it is it's about learning and then getting better um and achieving the goal that you didn't achieve the first time the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer, a creative person in some way, shape or form, maybe you've inspired them towards that path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Um, try to make, try to break the mold of what is, what you see that's been done before you that inspires you try to take that, learn from it. Um, but then break it and, 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 and do better. Um, cause we're not getting it all right. So, you know, look at the world around you, find out what it needs. It's going to need something different than what, you know, I think my generation needs. Um, and I think, you know, art is intrinsically tied to, how can we improve the world around us? How can we give it more beauty? How can we give it more freedom? Um, how can we bring liberation? How can we do those through the art that we create? And those questions um, and the answers to those questions are going to be different uh, for a generation behind me. Um, so do that. Uh, you know, again, I like, so that's 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 what i would say like how can you how can you look ahead um at the generation of that came before you and take what you like and and be inspired like you said but then how can you break the mold of what has come before to to be better to and to continue to um you know bring beauty and, and liberation and those things to the world around you in, in, in terms of art creation. Um, and you're going to have to be in tune with, with the world around you in some way. Um, like uh, Thorne is very much me being inspired by Batman and Spider-Man comics <laughs> through the years, very much like, um, um, so like, uh, if you've read the zero issue, the zero issues up for free. Uh, I, t I told this on a couple of podcasts, read the zero issue and then go read detective comics, 27, the first appearance of Batman. And, uh, it's a direct, uh, homage piece or homage or whatever to that. But it's like me saying, okay, but this character is different in this way. So like, here's what inspired the character but here's why it's different and and necessary for now um there's that um you know spider-man right his comics you'll see this in a couple of uh issues of thorn uh spider-man 
is going through the city. He's got to go get to, you know, Aunt May or whatever. He's got his thing that Peter's doing, or he's got his thing, you know, that he's got to stop Doc Ock. I don't know. But the thing, the filler of Spider-Man comics is there's always somebody doing petty crime that he has to stop, whether it's a supervillain or just, you know, regular Joe. He has to take the time as he's swinging across the city to stop them. Like, that's his, like, thing, right? And so um, Thorne, as he's moving across the city at different times, he has to stop and, and stop police nonsense. And whatever these police are doing right now, they shouldn't be doing to the citizens of the city and of his neighborhood. He, got, he, he needs to go and solve this crime, but he has to stop and, and deal with this police nonsense. And that's, that's kind of part of, of – so that's it's me taking these things – um, that inspired me as a, as a comic book reader and then doing something different um, uh, to, to for now, for today. Um, yeah, that's all. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, well, I mean, I'm writing a comic book about my life. And it's called Mustard Seed. So let's just stick with that because I've already done it. I'm terrible at titles. I hate them. But eventually, if I work on a story long enough, they kind of <laughs> work themselves out and I find one I like. It just takes a lot longer. So I say I'm terrible. I just can't come up with them right away. But Mustard Seed, let's stick with that. Um, album? I don't know. I'm not a big album guy, but I really like The Human Condition by John Bellion. So I'm going to say that. That's the first thing that came to my mind. So that one well i do hate to say it travis but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking i want to thank you so much for yeah. coming on the show thank you kurt for having me it's been a blast before i let you go where can we find you how can we support you and uh where can we find you online okay uh on twitter and instagram travis b hill five uh instagram is more of me just kind of posting about comics um and what i'm up to in comics uh, Twitter is where you get my comics plus my NBA thoughts, my theology thoughts, my political thoughts. So I can be a little bit more obnoxious on there. I'm sure I'm muted by plenty of people. So if you're just looking for comic updates, uh, go to Instagram, but it's Travis B Hill five, both of those, um, Travis B Hill comics.com. You can see a sample of my work. Uh, you can, like I said, the first issue of mustard seed, the thorn zero issue, as well as several other short stories. If you want to see a sample of what I'm up to and what I've been up to, um, and then lastly, support me by, you know, going out on July 5th to your local comic shop and picking up a copy of Thorn. If they don't have it, then figure out how to get it. That's all. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word T-O-W, not the number two. That's a totally different website you don't want to go to. And our yeah. website's going through a revamp. So go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back on your favorite podcast streaming service, Two Geeks Talking. Just search for that and you'll find this and thousand plus others on there as well, too. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.